Hello all and uh, welcome to our webinar on launching in Dubai, which is the startup guide to conquering the Middle East uh, territory. Thank you very much. My name is Srida Mayer. I'm the founder and CEO of HR Tech. Uh, we are a Singapore he uh, headquartered uh, HR technology solutions and advisory company. Um, a quick overview about myself. I have about 25 years of uh, practitioner HR experience. Our singular vision has been to work with HR teams and help them adopt technology and data in a bigger fashion. So we have been working with uh, HR teams across the Asia and Middle East region over the last six years in getting them on the uh, data and technology journey. Uh, personally, after 12 years in Singapore, I re relocated to Dubai early part of this year. It's been about six months in Dubai, and I think the journey has been really fantastic. Uh, with the global economy actually slowing down and a lot of regions uh, showing signs of slowdown, you know, we have had a lot of startups, especially the HR technology startups, reaching out to us and inquiring, hey, uh, you've moved to Dubai, you know, how is the Middle East region? How do we go about, you know, which country should we focus on? How is the talent landscape? How is the fundraise and uh, market potential? So these are questions that keep coming up. So this this webinar is specifically focused on uh, founders, CEOs, and chief sales officers of startups that are looking to enter um, uh, the Middle East region. And we are excited that today we have participants uh, across the globe joining in, at least who have registered, and hopefully all of them should be joining in soon. Um, a quick uh, webinar housekeeping roles. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded and will be available within a week's time. Uh, if you have specific questions, please use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the window and uh, put the name of the panelist that you specifically want this question to be answered and uh, put out your question. Please ensure you specify the name of the panelist, else if you have a generic question, you can leave it like that. Okay, the chant function has been enabled to allow for better engagement. So please uh, feel free to chat up and use the Q&A box, right? Uh, you don't have to uh, take screenshots uh, of these of the materials. All of this will be shared to you in a post event mail. So, and also uh, please checking the chat box, you know, the team will be providing a lot of information which you can gather from that. A quick background and context setting for this webinar, right? Uh, we have been, uh, we've been seeing the Middle East region actually becoming a strong, vibrant business hub, more so after the pandemic. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, you have uh, six countries in the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, GCC, and the GDP of the six countries is about 2.4 trillion as of 2022. And as per World Bank, these six countries' GDP is going to triple uh, in the next uh, 25 odd years. What is even more interesting is that when you look at the sovereign wealth funds, um, out of the top 10 uh, sovereign investors in 2022 who are very, very active, five of them were from the region, you know, be it Abu Dhabi Investment Authority or Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, Abu Dhabi's Mubadla, ADQ, Qatar Investment Authority, all of these, five of the top 10 globally active sovereign investors were from G from the Gulf region. So you sh you understand the kind of money power that is there, which is which can be tapped by all of us. The demographic milestone was actually hit in 2021 when uh, GCC had a overall combined population of 56. And that what you is called as a tipping point. And we have seen a lot of traction more so. Um, at this point of time, based on various estimates, UAE and Saudi Arabia have a talent deficit of 24 to 30%, depending on which sector, depending on which uh, uh, agency you look into. So that's a huge opportunity be, to be tabbed. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of companies setting up their headquarters in UAE and in Saudi, right? And more so, it's not just between UAE and Saudi. Within UAE, um, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, all of them are competing with each other to provide... Uh, the best possible, um, uh, you know, support. In fact, just yesterday, just yesterday, Abu Dhabi launched 
a new AI company called AI71, right? That's a phenomenal uh, initiative again by the Abu Dhabi government, right? Uh, on the screen, you will see a screen, uh, news item which says Saudi Arabia surpasses UAE as the fastest growing travel market. That gives you a sense of how much tourism is coming into the uh, region too. But uh, what we are saying is, hey, Saudi uh, GCC, MENA, Middle East is a large region. So what startups should essentially do is to target one or two countries to start with. Right and then approach, um, and you could have Dubai as your um, uh, you know anchor point, and then target rest of the region. Why Dubai? Right, if you really look at it, um, very very strategic location, just position between east and west. In fact, there is a, a data point for uh, uh, people who are interested in statistics. Right, you can cover two third of the global population from Dubai within an eight hour flight. So that's a, that's a great value proposition for uh, startups. If you can cover two thirds of the global population with an eight hour flight. Now, when you look at tech and innovation focus, there's been a, uh, you know, you uh, uh, DTEC is emerging as one of the largest technology hubs in, in Dubai, right? Uh, uh, Silicon YSS has been set up. You have Dubai Internet City, all the global players are coming in here. But why are they coming in here? One simple aspect. The ease of doing business, you know, um, UAE was ranked 16 in the uh, global index on ease of doing business and it's fast going up. And the government support here has been quite phenomenal, right? Whether you Dubai, Abu Dhabi or UAE as such, and now KSA, the government support uh, has been quite uh, tremendous. Free zone, free trade zones, tax exemptions. Earlier, you could you need to have a joint venture partner. Now you could have a full foreign ownership in some of these countries. Uh, no currency restrictions. All of these are uh, you know enabling Dubai to be a strategic point between New York and Singapore as a global hub. Now that's a big overview that I provided, but I have got uh, some fantastic speakers today. Uh, to walk you through this. So Shalab is the managing partner and chief operating officer of IXL Gulf Business Incubator, a, a very well-known face in the investment circles uh, in the uh, region. And uh, Shalab is going to walk you through what are the government support that you can tap into, what are the fundraise options for startups looking to enter Dubai. We don't forget the founders, right? The founder perspective is going to be shared by Grant. Grant himself is the founder and CEO of uh, Mingzulu. And he has had extensive experience uh, working in the region, more specifically in Dubai. And he's a fintech expert. So he's going to share personal perspectives of the founder on what you need to watch out for. And finally, you know, you can't miss the talent and staffing gameplay, right? Hey, uh, what is emiratization? What is Saudiization? How is the talent landscape? Do I need to hire people locally or do I need to move people uh, from my origin country? How difficult is it to move people or how difficult is it to hire? These are questions that Anirudh Ghosh, who is the senior vice president and the business head of Task Corporate Services, would be handling. So we have covered the business government perspective, fundraise aspects, the personal founders perspective and the staff uh, talent perspective. If you have any further questions, please feel free to use the uh, uh, use the, uh, options provided and uh, ask your questions, right? Um, this is going to be the agenda. My five minutes is over and I'm going to hand it over to Shalab. Uh, Shalab uh, and from, uh, after Shalab, it's going to be Grant and Anirudh who will be walking you through these aspects. And then we will have a Q&A. But meanwhile, don't restrict yourself. Please put in all your questions in the Q&A so that the panelists can uh, start responding to it. Um, I now invite uh, Shalab to take over uh, the next part of the session. Over to you, Shalab. Thank you so much, uh, Sriram. Really appreciate that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's on the call today. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, the managing partner and uh, chief operating officer for IXL Gulf. I'll give you a brief introduction about myself. I spent about uh, 22 years uh, in consumer and financial businesses, largely been a fintech and payments person, worked across both UAE and India with multiple banks. 
uh, including local and uh, multinational banks there. Uh, almost uh, two decades spent in understanding all aspects of uh, payments business, so cards, digital payment, digital wallets, uh, setting up payments businesses, uh, uh, worked with uh, both schemes as well as issuers, so worked with ICSA Bank, Barclay Card, uh, MRS NBD, which is uh, in the UAE, Rack Bank, which is in the UAE. Also worked with Visa for a good seven years, managing two regional roles uh, based in uh, Dubai. Uh, worked on multiple products. I've been extremely lucky to launch new products at market level. So multiple country introductions is what I've done for both Visa as well as banks such as MRS and MIDI who operate in multiple markets. Uh, over the course of my journey, I've also been a corporate trainer, uh, being in the job that I was and managing and leading businesses, uh, worked with large sales teams and business teams and trained them on various aspects of launching new technology, especially around launching new uh, payment products as well. I've been based in Dubai for the last 16 years, uh, have very... Uh, well traveled across uh, not just GCC but entire Middle East, Northern Africa, Lower Europe uh, as well, and uh, really understand all the different factors which uh, impact these markets, how businesses can really happen, uh, what are the key factors to keep in mind, so on and so forth. Yeah. I want to talk about and because I've been uh, largely been based in uh, Dubai, I wanted to talk about how Dubai is now emerging and is uh, setting its vision to be the new business hub uh, for the world. Uh, there are a number of factors which are now baked in and built into the vision of the government itself uh, to be amongst the top in the world. So uh, very quickly, I'll touch upon one of the things. So Dubai came up with a vision which is called the D33, which is Dubai 2033, a 10-year vision. Uh, one of the guiding factors in that vision is that they want to be amongst the top three cities in the world on a number of parameters. Uh, entrepreneurship being one of the key, because all along Dubai was known for trading and tourism, and now they're expanding into the zone of being the entrepreneurship capital of the world. The government has uh, taken a number of initiatives. It's one of the most empowering government here. It's extremely progressive. Uh, from a governance perspective, government is often quoted as example of uh, uh, being the best and the most progressive uh, ahead of the private sector, which is a huge uh, surprise for many because in other countries you would see it differently where the private sector normally leads with uh, innovation and governance. Uh, here the case is uh, the other way around. Uh, to prove itself that uh, Dubai is actually centered on driving uh, innovation and bringing in entrepreneurship, they have come out with uh, policies such as awarding 20% of uh, government's capital projects uh, to SMEs and startup, which is a huge uh, word of assurance and confidence building from the government to encourage uh, both SMEs and startup. Uh, uh, moving on, the... There's a large word saying that uh, and confusion around whether someone can own their business completely in Dubai or not. Now, that used to be the past. Uh, about a few years back, all of those conditions were actually changed. Dubai allows for 100% ownership of one's business, uh, which is pretty much in line with uh, all other centers of commerce around the world, which allow 100% uh, ownership of business. It does infuse a lot of confidence for investors as well who are coming into the market. Sriram touched upon the point that uh, geographical location is a huge advantage. Dubai is uh, close to almost uh, two-thirds of the world in a short flight, six, seven, eight-hour kind of a flight. But more uh, importantly, that Dubai is the gateway into not just uh, Middle East or GCC, but also grants access to lower Europe, the entire African continent, uh, all the subcontinent countries as well. So it becomes extremely easy to be based in Dubai and then uh, conduct business based on what, where one's markets are uh, very easily across this entire vast geography. Uh, in one of my previous roles at Visa, I used to manage a very large geography. It was called Central Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa, a bunch of about 84 countries. Uh, and for a, even MNC like uh, uh, Visa, uh, which was running these 84 countries, they were actually running it from Dubai, uh, given its strategic location. Uh, based on all the efforts and uh, initiatives that the government has taken, business has been made really easy. Uh, Dubai ranks number one continuously across a multitude of factors uh, regionally. 
But even on global scale, uh, and Sri Ram touched upon this, it ranks 16th in terms of ease of doing business. Uh, the way I see it, and having spent a long number of years here in Dubai, I think this rank can only uh, go higher and higher with every passing year because the government is committed to being the best in the world. One of the important elements for a lot of founders is uh, understanding the tax environment. It is extremely favorable for uh, people who are setting up businesses here. Uh, there is a, a corporate tax which was introduced this year, but it's amongst the lowest in the world. Uh, and then there is no personal income tax that applies. So it's an extremely favorable tax uh, environment uh, for uh, for anyone who's coming and setting up their businesses here. To add to that, there is also a very favorable legal structure. So Dubai has options of working with international court for arbitration as per English laws, which uh, gives a lot of comfort to an international community uh, if they want to conduct business. And then again, questions around is the business safe? What happens in case there is a dispute? Then there are international norms which are actually followed and applied on all the expat population here. Uh, from a business aspect, uh, it's a very well-known fact uh, that uh, Middle East offers the highest average revenue per user across sectors, both B2B as well as B2C, and across products and proposition. Uh, I can very clearly see that I, I do work with a lot of startups, and I'm going to touch upon the, the other side of uh, you know, what I do here. Uh, where startups uh, have established in India or other parts of the world, we had a U.S. startup that's coming in. And uh, whatever is the pricing in those markets versus when they come to the Middle East, it is almost 3x, 4x, 5x of that pricing. And the plain simple reason is that, one, there is an appetite to pay for the right product and service. There is a lot more respect uh, which is awarded versus a lot of other markets which are extremely price sensitive. So Dubai, the population in Dubai are extremely open uh, to, uh, to actually paying higher if the service deserves it. Uh, combined with the fact that uh, affordability and uh, uh, disposable incomes are extremely high amongst the top in the world, uh, it really makes the business extremely lucrative for a lot of startups coming in. Uh, the uh, UAE's currency is uh, uh, the dirham, uh, which is pegged against the dollar. So one dollar equals 3.67 dirhams. Uh, this is a fixed value. What that means is that if you're conducting business in dirhams, it is the same as conducting business in dollars. Uh, many times founders realize that you could have a rupee cost or if you're operating in any other market, your cost is of uh, 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 maintaining your products and platform is much lower because they come from your home country. But your revenue start becoming dollar denominated or dirham denominated, uh, which makes for a huge arbitrage opportunity for, for going to, to make a profitable business very, very soon. Uh, if you look at uh, operations, and I, I do see a lot of startups who have operations across multiple geographies, then a presence in Dubai can actually bring in the profitability factor much faster. It really lowers that cycle, uh, which is a huge thing. It also contributes back to the valuation of those companies. Uh, from an environment perspective, all the stakeholders are extremely tech savvy and it's not just the consumers or the government, uh, but it is also all the corporates They constantly seek technology solutions. At a personal level, Dubai does offer a very rewarding lifestyle uh, and with a multitude of entertainment options. It's also one of the safest cities in the world. Uh, I run a unit called IXL Gulf Business Incubator, which is uh, an accelerator which is supported and backed by Dubai SME. I'm a managing partner and chief operating officer there. Uh, the mandate that we have is to bring in technology startups from around the world and help them establish and grow from Dubai. What we offer is an end-to-end -end acceleration support. So we don't operate in a cohort manner, but we work with a startup at a one-to-one -one level. And uh, we offer everything that is required for a startup for a day one operation, which could mean that things such as which uh, very basic and in infrastructure, like setting up a mainland entity and getting a license and a trade license for that, having an office space and a co-working space, we provide that within our offices and we are housed actually within uh, Dubai SME's offices itself. We also bring in uh, a multitude of service providers uh, and partners 
who provide business support and uh, around different functions ranging from marketing, PR, compliance, taxation, uh, manpower, immigration, legal services, so on and so forth. What it means is that startups don't really have to hire on day one when they are launching in Dubai. On the other side, the most important factors that startups and companies that they look for is uh, people who can advise and guide and create that business. So we run a community of mentors and investors. It's, it's uh, uh, touching about 300 members now. These mentors and investors bring in not uh, uh, obviously the capital uh, from a personal investment perspective. But uh, more importantly, granting market access. So uh, connecting with various corporates, connecting with government, uh, connecting and guiding on different markets which can be opened up uh, is done by these uh, uh, mentors and investors. Uh, one of the most important things that we bring to the table is our connecting to the government. Uh, we have access to the entire government machinery. So if someone needs help across multiple departments, then we can actually work way, our way through Dubai SME, who is our patron, uh, to make this happen. Then. From a capital perspective, we do bring in a lot of sources for generating capital for startups. Uh, I did mention about the angel investor group that we have. That's uh, touching about 300 members. Hopefully by Q1, we will be 500 plus members. They are all based in the UAE. Uh, they are all investors. Some of them also operate as syndicate. Uh, IXL Gulf also has access to institutional investors, including family offices, micro VCs, VCs, financial institutions. Uh, and based on these two, our funding ranges from anything between a $10,000 to a $10 million. We, in fact, got soft commitments worth $15 million to a large EV company that was looking at Middle East as a market. Uh, in the near term, we're also looking at setting up our own investment funds uh, in collaboration with both um, uh, India. We have some operations in India and our parent company is there. Uh, as well as we are looking at uh, establishing a pool fund uh, with uh, support from the Dubai government. Uh, from a government mandate perspective, there are a lot of sectors of interest, uh, particularly if you look at uh, agri-tech, HR tech is extremely important uh, because these are underserved markets here and uh, food security, especially for UAE, has become extremely important. Uh, following on, there are sectors such as health tech, fintech, ed tech, sustainability. Uh, uh, Dubai is also host of uh, COP28, which is happening, uh, uh, which is starting uh, now, goes on till uh, middle of uh, December, which is an international uh, uh, seminar and uh, exhibition on, on climate. Beyond that, they're also looking at deep tech companies, B2B SaaS, because there's a large uh, both SME and corporate presence here. New age businesses such as esports and gaming, AI, ML, and Web3, they're all areas of interest as well. Uh, here's a selection of a few of the startups that we've actually set up, uh, and they range anywhere between the digital e-commerce platforms to FNB to B2B SaaS, FinTech, EdTech, uh, and they do come from multiple geographies. For example, uh, Acreda is an edtech from US. Task Tracker is a B2B company that comes from India. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Grant Neven, who is the founder of uh, Mingzulu, to please come over and share his thoughts here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shalab. Um, so, so afternoon, good morning, wherever you all are. Um, I think we've got a varied audience here. Um, delighted to to join you. And uh, the the team asked me to to really come on just to give you a bit of perspective around being a founder and setting a business up. So I'm going to similar to to um, Shalab. I'm going to share a few slides just to kind of put a bit of structure around this. Um, you'll have me for about ten minutes, but we're also going to do a Q and A um, at the end of this. And a little bit a bit a bit I guess a bit of background about me. Um, so I'll start off with a bit of context. Um, as to Grant, where I've come from, the business we've set up. Um, so we've um, we've been around since the start of this year. Um, however, I've lived and worked in the region for, for over 10 years now, um, based out of Dubai, also Abu Dhabi. Um, and I've, I've worked for one of the leading banks in Saudi Arabia. So I've got quite a broad perspective in terms of Middle East region. Obviously, by my accent, originally from the UK, from Scotland, Edinburgh. Um, and from a, a background perspective, I've had a number of different positions over my 
my 20 odd year career um, in the technology business um, back in the UK, predominantly working in the financial services sector. I've been a partner at Ernest & Young, um, so very familiar with big corporate global business. And as part of that, we were very, very active across the whole GCC um, in terms of supporting predominantly large enterprise organizations, but also some significant growth stage founders in terms of scaling out their operations. So I'll share some personal perspectives in terms of ingredients for success. Um, but over the last few years, um, um, as part of my own personal journey, I was heading up the digital um, focus for one of the, the large Saudi banks. As part of that, we set up um, um, operations in other geographies. We were um, scaling out capabilities, including talent around digital to execute, um, as well as looking at things like corporate venture capital and building out our, our, our broader portfolio. And all of this kind of culminated in, I decided at a personal level, time to do my own thing, um, to get out the big corporate environment, build a business that I personally was vested in, um, but also work with people and clients that, that we were particularly passionate about engaging with. So our focus um, in the organization, just to give you a bit of context to what we're doing, so then I can then align around some of the things that have made the likes of UAE and Dubai in particular attracted to us, has been around advising doing management consultancy for both established financial services organizations, helping them transition around the big shifts, especially related to technology um, and digital, but also working with growth stage founders in terms of scaling out their business, some international inbound looking to, to uh, engage and work in the Middle East, um, some looking to get access to funding. So we connect a lot of um, large in institutional investors, family offices, venture capital, with founders that we're supporting. And we also advise at board level on a number of organizations. So um, I'm an advisory council member for FinTech Tuesdays, which is a, an ecosystem that we've built up um, as, a, as a group. And we've got over a couple thousand members of that now based out of Dubai. Um, and we're also working um, with a number of organizations within their board to support their growth. So we're a partnership model. I've got two other business partners um, and we've got a number of pioneers, subject matter experts, and, and executors who can kind of come in with real hands-on practical experience. So for us, when we're, when we're kind of looking at um, our, our, our initial base, we're looking at Dubai um, as, a, as a region where not only um, to, to um, Shalab's points, you've got international law. Um, if, you want to, if you want to kind of settle um, in, a, in an English speaking court, you have access to that. You've got the domestic court system, which is again, very robust for a lot of business as usual activities. You've got a multitude of different free zones, which allow you to 100% own your business without having to have a local business partner, which was something that, that was in place um, many years ago. And it gives you freedom, depending on whether you're in the financial services sector, you're in um, a, a support business, you're, you're, you're in manufacturing or education, you've got various different opportunities to select a free zone that, that supports you and your business, provides access to a network, provides access to talent and capability that we personally, and we'll, we'll hear from um, Anarud from Task, we've, we, we engaged a number of professional services partners to help us scale up quickly, um, get ourselves established. Um, and it made it very easy. Um, so we were up and running um, when we set the, the, the new Ming Zulu venture up <clears throat> at the beginning of this year. Within a month, um, banks increasingly have been much more friendly to startup businesses. Um, we personally use Weo Bank, which has been a phenomenal digital experience. Um, so if you're an SME um, or even a more established business looking for a digital first proposition, You've got Weo Bank and many other digital banks that are operating out of the UAE that allow you to set up very quickly, didn't have to walk into a branch and have had access to all the kind of core capabilities, including invoicing support, et cetera, which has been very useful. So number one priority for us is about being in a location that you, allows us to use it as a launch pad into the broader Middle East region um, and also um, Asia and Europe um, with to support some of our international clients. So could not recommend um, UAE and Dubai specifically more. It's 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 phenomenal in terms of access to capability. Now, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking a bit about some of my own personal perspectives on, as a founder of a business, the ingredients to success. 
And I think the first thing is, and Dubai is a is a great platform in terms of the various different business networks for you to build your personal brand. And as any leader of a business, your personal brand is your superpower along with your leadership team. And the connectivity that we've had, um, not only in the last year, but previous years in terms of be it in big corporate roles I've had, as well as large institutional organizations, the access you've got beyond social media to, to build that brand is, is phenomenal um, out of the likes of Dubai. I think also there's a really diverse um, population here um, from various different walks of life, different, it's a very open cultural background background to this this place. There's, there's um, um, from a religion perspective, freedom um, to, to practice and believe in what you want. And with that, there's a great um, breadth of, of people with phenomenal energy looking to really change the way businesses and the ecosystem operates. So that positive energy for us is not only integral to our business and the people we engage with and our end consumers, but also in terms of the employees and making it a great place to work. Um, I think ultimately in setting up any business, it's uh, it's not a sprint. And I think the the support network that you have in the likes of Dubai in terms of getting access to people who are not looking to get paid often for, for supporting like-minded people and businesses, um, the collaboration that's, that's um, in place, um, we've got many, many, many different business partners that we work with that are increasingly supporting us on a longer term journey. And I think that's that's one key thing, not to burn yourself out in terms of trying to do everything at once. And I think there was um, Sriram talked about a, a really good bit of advice in terms of um, if landing in the Middle East, picking your markets wisely um, are very important. And Saudi Arabia, without doubt, is one of the major markets in this whole region. Um, is another kind of great place to be operating from, getting much easier to set up there. But you still has it's got more complexities than the likes of Dubai. So for a lot of organizations, in particular for us, getting set up in Dubai was a great opportunity for us to then service our clients in the Middle East, in the likes of Saudi Arabia and other geographies. So be very focused in terms of which markets you set up in um, that align back to your business operations. And I think... The, the network, which I've touched on, is something that's increasingly expanding. I'm seeing huge collaboration between various different business groups in both the UAE, Saudi Arabia, QA, Qatar, and, and GCC-wide, as well as international groups um, starting to come together. So we operate in the financial services sector. Um, Fintech Choose is a good example of a grassroots community that we've built up that's really servicing, supporting UAE. But we're seeing a much more international um, um, support network building into that now. In terms of partnerships, um, Shalab talked about various different um, capabilities that are in place. I think um, it's important to build out um, the, the right partnerships and you've got the right access to networks. Ac getting access to help is is incredibly important um, and never, never leave those debts unpaid. But I think also back to the banking relationships, cash is king in terms of um, the setup of a business and making sure you've got things operational here. Um, we've got many, many pieces of work we do with multiple clients, especially in the, the founder space where um, reward and shareholding, all these various different kind of propositions that are put together. You've got to balance that. And I think the 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 the, the legal and regulatory structure allows you to kind of operate in a way where you can be quite diverse in terms of how you run your business, setting up SPVs, for example, and some of the free zones and the regulated entities, again, is is, is very effective. And I think just to just to touch on um, some of the broader points, because I'm going to hand this over to to the likes of Aaron just to talk a bit about the logistics, especially when it comes to a people perspective. That we've touched on a few of these, but regulation and law, the legal infrastructure, is increasingly um, becoming globally recognised across a number of industries based out of the UAE more broadly, but in particular Dubai. So it's it's if you're a regulated business. Um, increasingly you're getting a lot a number of the free zones and picking those free zones effectively and getting the right advice is quite important to give your business the right level of kudos you need um, on an international stage as well as regionally the tech and digital infrastructure <clears throat> is second to none um, in terms of getting access to both government services but also organizations that support you and your partner network increasingly are digital first the talent base um, is increasingly important for any business and we're seeing more and more international talent deciding to pick Dubai in particular as their home, which is it's giving access to really incredible skills base. The real estate is phenomenal um, in terms of 
physical real estate assets that you need, both commercial and residential. And we've talked about the ecosystem. And lastly, just livability. It's um, um, I I often head back to the UK, back to back to Scotland, I can get back there in seven hours. I'm traveling around the region, um, but increasingly I love coming back to Dubai. It's just a phenomenal place to to live, have a family, build build all your friendships and, and your network. So, um, bit of context. Um, hopefully that's helpful. I'll I'll also kind of do the Q and A afterwards and answer any specific questions. So I'm going to hand over now to to um, Arunud, who I think now is going to give us a bit of context around the talent, staffing, and some of the operational aspects. So over to you. Hey, Grant, thank you so much. Um, um, a little bit about myself before I get into the subject. So I come with 22 years of experience in HR, BPO space. Um, I also work in organizations like Infosys, Wipro, and back in India. Uh, Dubai is home. I'm here for last uh, 15 plus years. I'm in the staffing space for last nine and a half years. Um, and I right now uh, run a business vertical within Task, uh, which is basically to provide the corporate services for uh, many organizations out here. Uh, today, uh, what I will do is that I will touch on some of the topics on the on the people aspect of the business. So for last 30, 35 minutes, uh, we heard a uh, Great storyline from Shalab on how, uh, how, how UAE and Dubai can actually help startups to come here and start their journey. Uh, we heard it from Grant also as a founder uh, that the experience he had. Uh, we heard from Shiram also how the, how the region is growing. In all these three stories, I think you, how, you found a common flavor uh, where people play a very, very important aspect. And I saw a couple of questions coming up around the people as well. So I'm going to share some of the slides um, and, and, and I'm going to answer some of the questions. Hope uh, that would be valuable for people on the call. And then we can move on to the Q&A quickly to answer if there are any more questions around, uh, around that. So, so um, Shalav, is my, uh, is my screen visible, um, Sriram? Yes, sir. All right, let me just put it on the presentation mode. Um, so I will talk about task a little bit later, uh, but but first of all, I think um, yesterday a phenomenal thing happened in this region. Uh, Saudi Arabia won the World Expo 2030, um, which means uh, within 10 years, within a decade, uh, this region had two World Expos. Uh, one is UAE, and now 2030 is going to be Saudi Arabia. Uh, now, now, now for the listeners, um, this is interesting. This is going to create opportunities for businesses. This is going to create opportunity for talent. Uh, this is going to create opportunity for investors. This is going to create opportunity for founders, uh, not only in Saudi Arabia, but also within UAE as well. Um, Middle East is growing rapidly. Yeah? So Middle East is growing from, from a business perspective. The business velocity is immense, as you heard from Shalab. And, and why so? I don't want to repeat everything because... Uh, UAE per se and Dubai for, for that matter has made doing business quite easy, right? And they want um, great talent to come over here, not from, a, not from a job perspective only, but from entrepreneurs, coders, innovators, artists, healthcare people to come and make this place ready for their 2050 vision. Um, the local compliance and the government laws is very balanced. It supports employees, employers, investors, and founders. So it, it helps everybody to foster equally. It, it doesn't, it is, it is not biased at any side. Uh, and it gives a great opportunity for everybody to have a great life out here. Uh, as you heard from Grant, it's, it's a great livability place, right? So, so the life is extremely good. It's a fast moving life. The infrastructure is great. And not only for not only for people who are at the working end, but also for families and children. I think it provides a huge cosmopolitan environment for people to work. Um, the talent landscape, uh, I think um, I think we spoke about B33. Um, it is again a 32 uh, trillion dirham uh, initiative which is coming up. Um, UAE has been a hotbed for talent, you know, and, and, and basically for three reasons. Uh, one, it is geographically very strategically placed. Um, access to Asia, 
access to Africa, access to Europe uh, is extremely easy. And, and UAE has built the infrastructure in such a way that it allows Harmony to live under one sky for 202 nationalities. Um, it provides diversity. Um, it provides access to um, various opportunities within the region. And you can also make UAE as a hub to access across the entire GCC region. Um, we have constantly seen after, after COVID that uh, UAE has recovered very fast. It had a very V-shaped recovery. And going forward, uh, we are seeing that the outlook for people towards career is very, very positive. So if, if you read the latest news from Beit and all, so 86% of working professionals in UAE are saying that uh, it's a positive career outlook, uh, not only for the next year, but next coming five years, the way things are moving. Um, Saudi Arabia has, has been transforming itself from last many years, right? Now, they have accelerated this transformation in last uh, two to three years. So we as an organization are present there for last nine years, and we are, we are being lucky enough to see that transformation. Uh, Saudi Arabia is changing its complete labor market structure, how people can work there, how people can change jobs there, how people can get in there, and what are the kind of opportunities they can do. Um, Saudi Arabia is actually helping talent to come in with ease. However, uh, they're also ensuring that their local population is being integrated with the with this entire economic boom. So they, they keep their nationalizations at the center of the discussion. They, they are creating uh, education system. They're creating the talent pool in such a way uh, that their local population can work seamlessly with the foreign population to support this growth journey. Um, Giga projects are happening. I'm sure all of you know about it. You know about the NEON, you know about the LINE, you know about the Red Sea projects. These projects are actually creating um, a, a good challenge for everybody. This, these are creating an absolute tremendous opportunity for talent to be there but it also reflects the talent scarcity in the market. It's also a great opportunity for people to come and live there um, and, and, also, and also be part of that growth journey. Uh, so Saudi is another big uh, area of opportunity for not only for talent, but also for investors and, and, and entrepreneurs who are planning to grow in this part of the region. Um, a little bit about task. Uh, task is in in presence for last 15 years in this market uh, we we are uh, our core of the business is uh, recruitment and deployment uh, we are a talent um, outsourcing organization uh, we are we are we are present in uh, organically in three regions and we support 68 countries uh, we have close to 5600 skilled workforce outsourced within UAE and KSA uh, our key strength is finding talent globally. So we have recruiters placed across the globe and we bring talent in this region. Um, over the last 16 years, we must have brought 20,000 people uh, in UAE uh, as an opportunity for job, you know. Um, and and this, this ranges from uh, the startup jobs of uh, youngsters who are, who are entering their career as sales promoters and sales executives. Uh, to to program managers and project managers who are earning at the scale of 120,000 dirhams per month. You know, so we work with uh, Dubai Future Foundation, Prime Minister's Office, Etisalat, Emirates Airlines, quite diverse, um, uh, quite diverse customer portfolio. And what it has done for us is that it has made us talk to a lot of HR practitioners and HR heads. Uh, not only from corporate side, but also from the startup side. And, and we have been able to understand the talent market quite well across UAE and KSA region. And we have been able to support in that journey. Just to give you a little bit of service aspect of what task group does, and I will not spend too much of time. So if you see the central part of it, it is primarily the, the, the staffing solutions business, right? Which is our mothership, uh, which is 80% of our business. So 
uh, contract staffing, permanent recruitment, uh, remote 360. If anybody wants to know more about it, do drop in a line. I will help you understand what these solutions are. Um, we did an out we, in 2019, just pre-COVID, uh, Task um, went out in the market asking the HR, uh, the founders and the entrepreneurs that what are the other gaps they see in the market where we can help them uh, solve some of the business problems so that they can focus in, in their core area. Uh, there are two key areas which came up and 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 we we started converting that into a is a business solution so we did a downstream integration where we saw that the whole hr compliance side of the business is is a bit of drain on the hr people right uh, so how to manage the payroll how to manage the visa immigration services uh, how to manage the hr compliance uh, how to manage bringing technology and that's where we work with sriram and his organization very closely so that whole HR downstream side of it became a very key area where we are supporting the market. On the upstream integration, uh, we work with incubators, accelerators. Uh, we help uh, founders, CEOs to set up organizations here uh, so that they can continue to focus on their business. But as I said, we do anything which is close to people. We, we, we want to stay close to the talent uh, area because that's our that's our, that's have been our strength and that's what uh, we are good at and we understand it very well uh, and we support organizations to get great talent uh, manage and then also be compliant around it uh, again just just all, because I see a couple of founders and CEOs are on the call and HR people are on the call just to just to help you understand how this perspective works uh, so in UAE it is very important. Um, that you, and, and specifically if you're a startup, um, and, and, and Grant uh, said it very nicely, is that you yourself is a great brand, right? So you have to build that brand. So you as a startup, when you're coming to this region and you're trying to attract talent, you need to create a great synergy and you have to build a brand around it so that you can attract that talent for you. So Task helps you in that whole recruitment part of it. Uh, so starting from uh, you know, sourcing candidate, uh, selling your dream to them, bringing them on board, and the whole gamut of the whole recruitment process we manage. Once we bring them on board, and, and if we are your agency partners, we make sure that we help them get compliant with the region. So their visa processing, their onboarding, and the end-to-end -end -end process, we manage it. Um, then also the whole HR side of it, we manage. So we don't want founders, CEOs to get drawn into managing the HR compliance side of it. They, they stay focused on, on their business. And last but not least, it's quite important in this part of the world, which, which many organizations have realized it hard way, uh, that when you are parting away with a talent and a candidate, you have to make sure that that process is also quite streamlined because they are your brand ambassadors when they move out as well. And also the compliance needs to be taken care of. These are the couple of areas. Um, I, I, I have nothing more to share. I think we should move on to the Q and A. And if, if the forum has questions, we are more than happy to answer them for you. Hmm. Thank you so much Sriram, for the opportunity. Thank you, Anirudh. Uh, you know, we have heard, uh, Anirudh, uh, Shalab and Grant talk about multiple aspects, right? Some key takeaways, definitely, which I would like to highlight is hundred percent compliance on the government rules and norms. Uh, that needs to be on top of your priority, whether it's KSA or UAE. And that's why you need to have local, uh, you know, folks uh, like Anirudh, like Shalab, who know the laws of the land and can effectively get it done. Number two, which Grant really highlighted was partnerships. I set up my entity about a year back and tried to remotely grow it from Singapore. But it does not happen that way. You need to be on ground. Uh, I have had founders who say I do three to four trips in a year, but still then the, you know, the business is not growing. Well, you need to be here on ground, build that networks and you need to have strong local partnerships, right? Most of the events uh, that happen here are and meetings are face to face. So it is important to have that. And then the talent related aspects, there are multiple models, right? One, you can raise funds, hire people locally, grow the business. Number two, you could have local partners uh, who could, uh, you know, deliver it for you on a reseller mode. Number three, you could you could get into arrangements. We have had arrangements with a lot of HR tech uh, product companies. We act as the retainer services uh, arm and support them. So there are multiple models that you can tap into to effectively grow your business, right? 
So you need to uh, identify what model, how do you want to scale up the business? And most importantly, as Grant highlighted, which country am I going after? And in, in that country, what should be the strategy? I think when I talk to most of the pro providers, they seem to be focusing all across GCC, wherever there is business in Qatar or Oman, they try to go after, but I think there needs to be a more focused approach. Now, uh, we have had a lot of questions that have come up, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of these and, and take uh, you know in-person feedback. Um, so there has been a lot of questions on uh, the, the tax part of it. Uh, so Shalab and Grant, would you want to quickly cover on the corporate tax and personal tax? Um, uh, yeah, I can give a very uh, quick uh, view. It's a 9% corporate tax, which was introduced this year. However, there are eligibility criteria and exemptions uh, which are applicable. It will depend on the volume of revenues generated as well as where the company is set up. So there are combinations uh, there. On the personal income tax, uh, right now that's not been introduced. So this is a tax-free country at a personal level. Yeah. And just, just, to, just to add to that, Shalab, I think... Obviously, VAT is something that's um, been rolled out across the GCC. It's 5% in the UAE. Um, the likes of Saudi and other GCC countries have, have put it in place. And typically, that's for services that are deployed within the country. So if you're doing business within the UAE, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, and you're a Dubai-based company, typically VAT has to be added. I think the corporation taxes, Shalab touched on, is something that there are... There are um, waivers, um, but the this is something that is in place now. So any business, typically, I think the the rule of thumb is if you're earning um, generating over three hundred seventy five thousand dirhams of profit, typically you can expect to start seeing nine percent corporation tax applied to anything above that threshold. Um, and and obviously for a lot of individuals, it's very attractive to live and work here because you're not paying a huge wedge of money out like you do in other mature economies to the taxman. So, um, so yeah, from from a, an attractability perspective for talent, that's definitely something that's that's worth worth um, looking at for this space. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, uh, question to Anirudh. Anirudh on emiratization. There are a lot of questions, right? Would you want to quickly uh, focus on what emiratization is about? Which con which kind of companies are covered? A quick overview. Um. So. Um, some people call it emiratization. Um, the term that we all should use and we are using nowadays is called nationalization. It is, um, it's an initiative taken by the government uh, to help national population get integrated with the private sector businesses, right? That's what emiratization is all about. Um, and, and, the, and every organization uh, for now, which is based out of mainland, um, is part of the emiratization story. Um, most probably in coming years, organizations within free zone will also be, uh, uh, will, will be, will be part of this journey as well, because they, there are some great organizations out there. Uh, emiratization ranges from organizations who are size of, um, uh, 50 and above, uh, and you have to have a percentage on, on year on year basis. Uh, now there, there's always a thought that. Uh, if it is a UAE national, I need to hire, then there is an additional cost than what I need to, there's an incremental expense than what I need to pay to a expatriate or a foreign worker. Actually, it is not. Uh, government very clearly says that the salary parity will be there irrespective of what nationality they are. So whether it's a foreign national or a UAE national, so you don't have to anything pay extra. The only thing that you have to help them with is, is the pension contribution, right, as part of they being the national uh, of the country. Uh, we have seen a huge amount of investment by government, which is the Nafis program. They actually pay a part of the salary to these UAE nationals when they join a private sector. For an example, if you pick up an engineer at a salary of 8,000 dirham, a portion of their salary comes from the employer and a portion of the salary does get supported by the Nafis program themselves. And this is, this is, to ease the pressure on the on the private sectors because they're new to the journey. And we have seen a huge amount of change in the mindset. Uh, so we we employ close to 120 UAE nationals in our organization. They have been integrated quite well across our clients and with the internal organization. And there's a huge amount of interest among them to learn, uh, to be part with the organization, to contribute and actually make an impact in the in the organization's productivity, right? So we have seen that huge amount of change because government is 
helping them to get integrated. So that, that's what UAE Nationals uh, amortization concept is. In Saudiization, just to 30 seconds, is there are certain roles which are completely uh, under the Saudiization, like any front-end customer service role. They are completely under the uh, regulation that it has to be served by a Saudi national. Again, this is a part of the journey where they want to bring the talent pool up to the mark. Fantastic. And Ruth, there's a follow-up question from Vikram of Intern Chala. He's, he's been asking about uh, how are UAE and KSA in terms of tech startups, how easy yeah. is it to attract talent? That's so I was just I was just typing that Vikram answer for Vikram. Uh, so, uh, sorry Vikram, I, I couldn't type faster than Shriram asking me the question. So, um, look, attracting talent is always challenging, right? So, uh, good talents are in scarcity in this world, right? It's always challenging. But having said that, uh, Saudi has built a great story. Uh, if you if you go to any of the any of the social media posts and and if you actually go to Riyadh, so I visit Riyadh quite often. I'm sure Shalab does it. So, uh, it has completely transformed. Uh, the 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 way uh, Riyadh has changed or the Saudi has changed is completely different. So. Yes, attracting challenge is always difficult out there, but we are seeing a huge amount of IT uh, talent getting mobilized to Saudi Arabia to support uh, the government and the private projects out there. Uh, people are more open to move to Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, our organization, internal organization, was a 20-people organization at the start of the year. Today, we are 100-plus people, an internal organization. And we have approximately 14 to 1800 people outsourced uh, across PwC, BCG, and other organizations. So there's a huge, huge amount of uh, transformation and, and attraction that is happening for people to come to Saudi. Thank you very much, Anirudh. Uh, maybe one quick 30 second takeaway from Shalab Grant and Anirudh. Maybe we can start off with uh, Shalab. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, many times we look at, um, uh, I'll, I'm going to use uh, the term called the tipping point. The region is at that tipping point where it's about to take off in a big way. Uh, the ecosystem is very fair. It's uh, boosted by the government's initiatives here. So anyone who's looking to expand globally, Middle East, particularly UAE and Dubai, become a great spot to start that journey. So, uh, yeah. Grant? Okay. Yeah, I just to build on that, um, the 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 globe is going through many many challenges just now um, on business, um, cultural, um, geopolitical fronts. I think increasingly, I'm getting reached out to by many many people from all kinds of different geographies um, looking to move here. Um, it's a stable environment. There's a very robust business infrastructure in place. The economies, relatively speaking, are in a good place, um, and it's and and the quality. I touched on this: the livability and the quality of lifestyle and the freedoms, which perception is Middle East doesn't give people as much freedom as of some other geographies do, and that's increasingly, in particular, in Saudi Arabia, changing massively. Literally year by year, it it gets more and more open, more and more di diverse. So so it's uh it's an exciting place to be. Thank you. So, so it's a it's and and what Grant said it's it's harmony in diversity. Uh, what we all say is that uh, maybe the center of the world is changing, and it will be somewhere around this place. The way uh, the the futuristic leadership of this region is driving the growth um, to build it for the next fifty years. I think that's phenomenal. So this is the place to be. Thank you very much, Anirudh, Grant, and Shalab. Really appreciate the time and effort to share your knowledge with the participants. Thank you once again to the uh, panelists and the participants for joining us across uh, the globe.